So the premise here is that understanding scientific principles about learning can help us as teachers and help us as university communities to develop more effective teaching and learning programs and student success programs. I want to say from the outset that it's certainly, science is certainly not the only way to understand teaching. In fact, I also very much believe that teaching is a creative act. It's a great art to be a good teacher. Uh, and so that is absolutely a part of this process as well. But I really want to focus on science because, uh, as Adam is say, uh, said in the introduction, the phrase, the science of learning, is everywhere in the higher ed press uh, these days. One of the issues, though, is that it's not really clear what that phrase means. Uh, and in fact, you probably all have your own interpretation of that right now, just going through your head. Uh, and what I have found is that sometimes writers and, and speakers and public figures who use the science of learning uh, are using it as a proxy term for establishing a credibility that has not yet, for the argument that's not yet been in place, right? Uh, the idea here is if you just uh, if you just stick that phrase in, suddenly people are paying attention. Oh, it's science, right? Uh, without really clarifying what it is that we're thinking about and what it is that we're talking about. And so part of what I want to stress today is that science can be a really valuable tool for understanding teaching and learning, but we have to be really specific about what we're talking about. Which, uh, which kinds of scientific principles are we interested in? The other, uh, the other thing that you'll notice as you turn the pages of the Chronicle of Higher Ed or Inside Higher Ed when people are talking about the science of learning is that it, uh, in some ways it's pitched as a cure for everything that ails higher education, right? Uh, as if we just sprinkle a little science of learning on it, everything will be better. And that too, I think, is, is not always the case, right? What we need is to be very clear about what it is that we're thinking about. What is our problem? What is our issue? What is our concern? And how might science better inform our practice? And so that's, that, that's sort of the underpinning of what I'll be talking about today. My own story, uh, it, you know, you've heard the institutions, but I, did, I began uh, my career at Columbus State University in Georgia, which is a mid-sized regional comprehensive university just on the border of Alabama and Georgia, has an open access mission for the surrounding counties, uh, admissions policy for the surrounding counties there. Um, lots, of, lots of diversity among the student body. Fort Benning uh, is in Columbus, Georgia, which is the largest army training facility in the country. So we had a lot of active military veterans as a part of that community. And I loved the teaching that I did there. Uh, I loved every minute of working with the students. But at, at, uh, after a certain point, I decided that I wanted to move in a different direction to, to think about teaching and learning initiatives at, uh, at, at a different scale and to think about what, uh, what, what are the new directions possible for teaching and learning in America and higher ed. So uh, as I moved into educational development, I had a lot to learn. I did a lot of reading, and, and one of the things that I was drawn to was the, the scientific approach. And as I was, as I was reading, uh, I was reading, first of all, a couple of things. Lots and lots of handbooks out there for how to implement different teaching strategies. There's literally a handbook for anything you might want to do in the classroom. And I know the clear people can, uh, can point you to any one of those, right? Uh, but, all, but all of that left me a little uh, really unsatisfied because my questions weren't necessarily what worked. My questions were why do some things work and other things not work? If I'm going to think about teaching at a different level and recommend practices to faculty and use them in my own classroom, I want to understand how people learn and how different teaching strategies connect to the actual ways that we learn information. And so as I moved in that direction, uh, one very prominent thread of that discourse uh, is cognitive psychology and cognitive approaches to this question. So the two books I have up on the screen are pretty well known. Uh, and in fact, they have dominated the discussion of the science of learning. So the, the book on the left, Make It Stick, great book. Maybe it's in the Clear Library, I don't know. But, uh, uh, but uh, this, uh, this came out just a few years ago. And the, of the three authors there, the, the last two are very prominent cognitive psychologists. They've made their career studying how 
people remember things more effectively. Things like the testing effect that you may have heard of, those are, those are the two who have really studied that and, and brought it to the fore. Uh, and so this book is kind of um, a, a, a documentation of their research program and how we can help students remember things, how we can utilize that information once they do remember it. The first author there, uh, Peter Brown, is actually a novelist who they hired to make the book more readable, which <laughs> could be an indictment of academic writing. I'm not sure. I mean, it works. The stories are, are good, but uh, it, they kind of yielded the floor to the novelist uh, in that regard. But, um, but what I found was when I started to talk to people then about the science of learning and how it can inform our work as teachers, uh, people would immediately say, oh, you mean like make it stick? Uh, and yes, that is true, and that is one thread of this conversation, cognitive psychology and remembering. But as we all know as educators, teaching and learning is a heck of a lot more than just remembering information. And so while I value this research a lot, I thought it was only one part of the, of the answer, one piece of the puzzle to teaching and learning. What I was most interested in were other kinds of, of factors. How did we begin to learn the way we do now? What is the kind of evolutionary story behind learning? How do, how do children learn? How, do, uh, how does that learning process change over time? And most importantly, I think for our work as educators, what happens to that over time? And how do we kind of uh, draw it back into our work in the classroom? So that, uh, that part of the question led me to the project that eventually became the book. And what I, what I found was I was wandering into different fields uh, which I had not covered or touched in about 20 years uh, since I was in college. Anthropology, uh, evolutionary biology, uh, developmental psychology, neuroscience, and so started to wade in uh, and, and took my time. It took five years to write the book because I wanted to learn myself the methodologies of those disciplines, learn how to read the papers, how to evaluate the papers, and, and make credible claims uh, in this sphere. Um, and so I was, I was finding a lot of different information, but there wasn't any organizational principle to it yet. I was just kind of uh, cultivating and collating ideas until a good friend and colleague gave me this book, which is an amazing book. I know Jenna's reading it now. Uh, uh, the Scientist in the Crib, written by these three, uh, these three developmental psychologists who are, who are um, big players in, in, this, uh, in their corner of that particular world. Um, and I saw this quote, scientists are such successful learners because they use cognitive abilities that evolution designed for the use of children. And suddenly, that, that gave me the map uh, that I could connect the dots to this information. That learning is a story, it's a narrative. The story of human learning is deep and complex uh, and has many threads to it. But it's a story that is a continuum as well that we learn in very much the same way that we've always learned. And adult, the adults in our classes learn very much the same way that children learn. Yes, we mature, and yes, our brains change, but the mechanisms by which we learn are relatively consistent over time. And this particular quote is so powerful because it suggests not that children can make scientific discoveries, they can in their own way but that scientists can do what they do because they're using what children uh, are using to learn about the world for the first time. And that's a powerful claim. It's a powerful claim and I think a powerful way to frame the work that happens in our classrooms. That this is a, this is a, a continuum, a, a kind of a beautiful story. So as the, with that, uh, once I had that kind of framing device, I really landed on five ideas that kept coming up over and over and over again in different corners of the research, right? Uh, and the, the sort of uh, training that I have as, a, as someone in the humanities and synthesis and close reading benefited me here because I was seeing patterns everywhere. The issue that I was finding, though, is that the developmental psychologists were not talking to the biological anthropologists. And as you know, academia has silos and... Uh, and uh, none of that is more clear than once you start digging down into individual disciplines, right? And so uh, a, lot of what I, uh, a lot of these ideas uh, are present in many different strands of research, and what I was trying to do is to synthesize them together. 
So curiosity, sociality, emotion, authenticity, and failure. I'm going to focus on uh, sociality, emotion, and authenticity for just a few minutes this morning, and then the workshop, we'll get back to the other two. Um, but sociality, let's, let's look at that one first. That, uh, very simply, human beings are amazingly social creatures. That, uh, that defined our development as a species, and it certainly defines how we operate every single day, how we live our lives. We live it through social, social connections with other people. In fact, there's some really interesting and sad uh, research uh, on what happens when human beings are isolated from other people. It has um, uh, amazing health detriments uh, and psychological detriments as well. So we actually need other people. It's not just like it's a good idea to be around other people. We need other people, and, and that's deeply rooted. And one of, the way, one of the places that we see that connection most vividly is in the classroom, in learning environments. And for a long time, people have known that we learn better from other people than we ever can from ourselves, right? Uh, and, and so uh, one of my, uh, one of my uh, kind of co uh, uh, intellectual heroes, Lev Vygotsky, uh, he's a social psychologist from the mid 20th century. Him and Piaget kind of went head to head a lot. We'll talk about Piaget later. He's a love him or hate him kind of guy uh, in the field. Uh, but Vygotsky said, uh, was one of the leaders in saying, we need other people to learn. And he came up with this very uh, dull uh, concept uh, in title, but really brilliant in theory, called the zone of proximal development. And what he said was, as individuals, any given topic, we can only learn so much by ourselves before we need what he called a knowledgeable other. That could be a teacher, a coach, uh, a, a peer, to move to uh, where we could ultimately go with that. And that's true, and that uh, is a nice consolidation of what most people have found in terms of social connections and their power for learning. Now we see, uh, we see social connections all the time. Uh, and the classroom itself is, is a kind of microcosm of society. Student, society doesn't stop at the, at the walls, right, of the classroom, it's, it's a part of what we do. And so, uh, what, the, what the scientific research suggests is that we need, in order to maximize learning, we need to heighten the social connections of students and really design activities and assignments where they need to collaborate successfully in order to build knowledge together. Now I have this, uh, this photo. They seem like they're having a great time in this group project and they're, uh, they're working really well together. Uh, they seem to be agreeing and making a lot of progress. And the reason I have up, uh, this up here is because it doesn't necessarily represent my experience with group projects in higher education. Um, and so what we know about sociality is that if students are going to learn, we need to give them opportunities to make meaning together, right? Again, you, at some point you need someone else to make meaning together. Unfortunately, the way, uh, the way collaborative learning often takes place in the classroom is that it's, uh, they're designed like individual assignments in sheep's clothing, right? Uh, and students who have, who have mastered the strategic approach to education get the group assignment and they say, you do that part, I'll do this part, and you do that part. We'll go off and we'll do our thing. We'll meet right before we present, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll magically get an A, right? Now, that has its advantages, I guess, in some ways, especially for the student, but that does not draw on what we know from the research on social connections to really maximize learning. If, what, if that's what we want, we need to give students activities, big questions, assignments that they depend on each other for, uh, to generate that knowledge. Now, that's tricky, right? And so that's where the actual that's where the work of teaching really comes in then. How do we do that? How do we design those kinds of assignments? And there are ways, uh, asking open-ended questions, tackling authentic projects that we'll talk about in a second. So giving a team of students a data set they've never seen, they have to rely on each other to make sense of that information, to create uh, hypotheses of, of, what they're, uh, of the relevance of what they're looking at. So somehow we need to we need to move to this ideal world, um, and 
students uh, have been through a kind of educational system where they're conditioned not to approach collaborative learning in the ways we're talking about right now. So there's psychological barriers as well to implementing some of these things. Okay. So sort of going through these three quick, again, we're going to dive more deeply into to, uh, curiosity and to failure, but I also want to leave some time for questions in, in this part of it as well. Emotion. This, is, uh, this was by far the most meaningful part of the project for me uh, in a lot of different ways, one of which was I think many of us have intuitions that connecting to students' emotions in the classroom leads to better learning. Uh, but what was, uh, what was so remarkable to me is how much research support there is for that intuition. How we prime students' emotion and connect to students as emotional beings actually helps them to learn more in the classroom. Now, that can be a whole variety of ways. So it doesn't require us, uh, it doesn't require, uh, us to build emotional courses. It requires us to think about students as actual human beings in, in our classrooms who have emotions and who may have emotional connections to what we're talking about. And we're talking about here a whole range from simple to more complex of things that we could do in the classroom. Uh, showing enthusiasm for our subject matter is actually a way to connect to students, uh, to connect to students' emotions, right? That they see that we're excited about it, that, that primes something in them to connect to the material. That's an easy way, right? Knowing students' names. That is one of the foundational, fundamental ways to connect to students as actual people and as emotional beings, right? If you use their name, they reckon internally, even if they're not cognizant of it, they are, they are making a connection to you, right? Oh, this person cares enough about me to use my name, right? Now, if you're teaching 500 students, that's a little tricky. Uh, I, we have this amazing faculty member at Rice who has a, uh, just a, an amazing memory and memorizes all 300 students in his class every semester. No one knows how he does it, and he doesn't reveal his tricks, although I've been trying to get him out of, uh, out of them. But um, beyond that, if that's not your memory, that's fine, because that's not my memory either. Um, but one thing that we can do that, that allows us to utilize the benefit of the strategy Simply giving students name cards that they can put in the front of their in front of them, so that you can call on them even if you haven't remembered their name. It, it has the same benefit emotionally for them, but it, you don't have to have memorized 300 names. Um, so those are some simple strategies. Uh, other other ways that we can do this, though, storytelling in the classroom, finding the emotional components of our subject matter. Doesn't matter what we're teaching. There are ways to tell stories that will connect to a student's emotion. You know, for uh, the, an example I used in the book, uh, imagine two different biology classes, uh, both of which are talking about the biology of cancer. One is only talking about it at the cellular level, another is talking about it at that level, but also showing uh, videos of survivors. Students in that other class remember the emotional impact of the stories at exam time and that leads them to the information that they learn. So we're talking about emotion not just as a great thing to have, but as a component that leads to better learning. So the, the metaphor that I often use here about emotions, emotions and cognition go hand in hand. They're like dance partners following the same choreography. And when everything is going well, one is priming the other, and you, you have just the, this, this harmony of learning at work. Uh, you know, for a very long time, there was a, 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 a heated, surprisingly heated, by the way, debate in psychology, which comes first, thinking or feeling, right? Uh, and there was, a, there was a heated debate about that. Now what scientists most, uh, most lean toward is that we have parts of our brain that are activated both in cognitive activities and in emotional, uh, in emotional moments that they're working together can't isolate any parts of the brain for any one activity, that this is, a, this is a united front, the dance partners following the same choreography. But the, tr the, the catch is about emotions. We've been talking about the positive stuff. The catch with emotion is that if emotion, especially negative emotion, reaches a point that crosses beyond, uh, the point beyond which a student can regulate that emotion, the cognitive properties shut down, right? 
And there is nothing you can do as a teacher to start it back up again until you deal with the emotional component at play. Now, most of the time, you may not know it's happening, looking out on the sea of students. You may not know it's happening. But sometimes you can, and you might be able to address it there. But the emotion surpasses our ability to regulate it. We cannot learn anything. Right? It shuts down our cognitive processes. And so that, uh, that's an important factor in a very, very heated and popular debate uh, about college students right now. This is from George Will uh, a few months ago. And, uh, and uh, he's talking about, as there are some pundits that do, he's talking about trigger warnings and safe spaces in this op-ed. Right? And the George Wills of the world, and many like him in very popular new books, suggest that students want trigger warnings and safe spaces so that they can avoid complex material. The science on emotions and learning suggests that that is absolutely wrong. That, uh, that students need mechanisms to help them regulate emotions so that they can participate more. Right? In some ways, I think if we started calling trigger warnings pre-regulatory devices, that would shut down this debate pretty quickly. Right? We just change it a little bit and call it what it is, a tool to regulate an emotion before the subject matter is presented so that they can actually participate, we might be able to have more productive conversations about this. Because what those strategies are, are not avoidance mechanisms. Students are not asking to be left out of conversations. They want to be a part of them. And what they know is, and what we know from the research, there are ways that we can help them be a part of those conversations by attending to the power of their emotions and how that has an effect on their learning process. Right? So lots of different dimensions with this. We can certainly talk about more in Q&A. And the last, uh, the last component I'll talk about in, uh, before the break here is authenticity. Um, now, authenticity, it's sort of a buzzword. So I knew if I was going to... Uh, if I was going to title a chapter authenticity, I had to define it right away. And the way I'm defining it is the way cognitive psychologists define it when they talk about cognitive authenticity uh, or cognitive realism or situated cognition. What they mean by this is that our brains are really good at uh, making quick decisions about whether something is relevant for them. Right? They will make a quick decision. Do I need this information? Nope. I'm going to start thinking about baseball then. Right? Uh, is, this a, is this a situation that is, uh, that is attuned to the real demands of a specific domain? Right? And, and you know, some, some things that you're probably already thinking about, experiential learning, undergraduate research, things that allow students to do what scholars in the discipline do, have a high degree of authenticity, cognitive authenticity, because our brains are registering them as being real environments, authentic learning environments, rather than artificial learning environments, right? Where they can kind of tune out right away. And that decision happens unconsciously, and it happens quickly, and it, it takes cognitive resources in the opposite direction when it happens, right? Uh, and so I want to just dig into this a little bit more. Uh, that's an actual airplane and a flight simulator. Both of those, according to this research, have very high degrees of cognitive authenticity. Flying an airplane and, and being in a flight simulator. Those are both very authentic because our brains register them as real scenarios, right? Now, one, of course, has a greater chance of you know, human, <laughs> uh, cost of human life and equipment, right? And so we want people in simulators. And there's also some great research on this uh, for nurses and for doctors uh, who are training to be surgeons, doing simulations, authentic simulations, actually has as good or better uh, uh, odds of success once they actually get into the operating room uh, than, uh, than practicing on human patients, right? And so, the, the, and the reason for that is because they're both authentic. So, how do we, how we build this into our, uh, our classes uh, to help students learn what it means to operate within a scholarly domain. And not just to tell them about it, but to actually get them working in it. So whereas the literature says both of these have a high degree of authenticity, it also says 
hearing a lecture about how to fly an airplane has a pretty low degree of authenticity, right? Because our brains, our brains say, okay, that, how am I going to use this, right? I'm not in a plane or in a simulator. What does this mean? That is not to say we ditch lectures, uh, you know, and I certainly don't want to enter that debate right now, uh, because I don't believe it. Uh, lectures have a place as a tool in the teaching and learning uh, uh, toolbox just like any other activity, right, any other strategy. But if we're thinking about authenticity, it is among our lowest kinds, uh, it, it registers among our lowest levels of cognitive authenticity. So the ways that we can get students to actually doing the work of the discipline, they're going to learn more because they're approaching it as if it's a real environment. Good. All right. So the real question, though, here, and the one I pitch in my title, why does it matter? Why does any of this matter? Uh, why should we pay attention to this research? Um, and I think it matters a lot for the, the present and the future of higher education. And the first thing I want to talk about uh, it inoculates us against edufads. There is a new idea coming down the pike every five minutes, it seems like, in higher education. Try this, try that. Uh, and uh, it may be similar on this campus. I know on my campus, there's a real weariness. There is a fad fatigue in terms of new ideas that are kind of uncritically assessed and yet presented as uh, <clears throat> new directions for teaching and learning at a university. I think that the scientific research we've been talking about today gives us a kind of inoculation against that. It gives us tools that we can use to say, I don't think this is going to work. And here's why I don't think it's going to work, and kind of check those boxes. On the other hand, it also gives us tools to say, I think this is really going to work. Or have you looked at this? Because this has this particular idea has a pretty high chance of success, given what we know about how humans learn. So let me give you an example. If we hopped into our mental time machines and went back, way back to the year 2012, you would hear two different concepts being talked about everywhere. MOOCs and flipped classrooms. Right? They were everywhere in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Even the New York Times was writing about MOOCs. Um, and so if we, if we went back in our time machine and we, look, and we took this logic here, uh, we would say, okay, MOOCs, interesting. Uh, 100,000 students. Um, are they going to engage with each other? Sometimes. Are they ever going to see each other? No. Uh, and uh, are they going to work together? Well, the 9% the of the ones who finish the MOOC may work together in some capacity. So as I think about that, I would say, this is a red flag from the science of learning perspective, and I would wave that uh, from the, the levels of authenticity, from the levels of sociality, and some of the concepts we haven't even talked about yet. On the other hand, flip classrooms. OK, well, you want to take the content stuff out of the classroom and push, it, uh, and push it outside in order to do more authentic work inside the classroom. Now, that, to me, has promise as I, look at the, as I look at what I know from the science of learning. So uh, now, there are caveats there. What are they doing outside of class? How are they engaging with that material? And what are they doing inside of class? And how are those activities designed? So there, there are real ways we need to pay attention to that. But if I think about those two things that dominated the, our discussions in higher education, I, I can use the science of learning to say, I, I'm not so sure about this one. This is one I think I might want to pursue. It gives, us, it gives us ammunition. It gives us tools to be able to make those decisions as faculty and administrators more productively, I think. It also, and I think this is an important one, it allows us to check our intuitions and assumptions. Right? I have a lot of assumptions and intuitions about what I think will work with my students. But this research actually gives me information that I can use. Was that assumption right? I'm, uh, this one doesn't look like it was. This one has some legs. Let me see. Let me build on it from what I know from the research. Uh, this third bullet, uh, this has become kind of a, a hobby horse of mine. Uh, it helps us to build stronger, more cohesive, and more integrated student success programs. I think at most universities in this country, there are new uh, student success programs, new student success efforts. You're probably hearing that term a lot, student success. And what I have found. Uh, by and large, both in the national discourse and even on individual campuses, 
is that teaching and learning are often left out of those conversations, uh, which is kind of astounding to me because the classroom is sort of the front lines of student success efforts, right? They're going to succeed in the classroom, and that's going to have major impact on their success in college, right? The science of learning allows us, I think, to take a closer look at what, it, what student success means and how to enter into those conversations. What does, how, can we help, uh, how can we help maximize the work that faculty are doing in their classrooms and be a part of those conversations, right? I think, that, I think that's really important uh, for the future. And another future-focused uh, way that I think the science helps, it's, it can serve as a litmus test for future pedagogies as well. If we know how human beings learn, we can make strides toward developing new teaching strategies that are, that are even better than the ones we're using now. And we can really kind of maximize their learning by using what we know works best for them and designing new strategies based on that. Thank you. So I think we have, uh, I think we have six minutes for questions. Is that right, Jen? OK, all right, good. OK, so we have, uh, we have time for Q&A. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, coming here, you know, reinforcing. Uh, but the thing is, is I would like to know your opinion on learning styles, in particular when you were talking about groupings and how students interact together to promote learning. Coves right. is saying that you should group them according to the preferences or the way they best learn. How do you feel about that? <laughs> That's a big question. That's a big question. I love that you asked it. Um, okay, so uh, learning styles. Um, they've been, it's a, a concept that's been in vogue for a very long time, even though cognitive psychologists have kind of disproven it, uh, the, the actual um, relevance and benefit of the learning style research over the last uh, 15, 20 years. And what I mean by that is that when, when we say learning styles, most people are thinking visual, uh, audio, uh, kinesthetic, tactile, those kinds of learning styles. And the original learning style research said you were one and only one, and that is how you learned. And so people aren't disputing the fact that there are some uh, who may learn a little bit better visually in some contexts, but what, what I think we found is that students have different learning preferences depending on the learning context, right? And so sometimes they will need to read something to process it. Sometimes they'll need to actually just get in there and do it to learn it best. Sometimes they'll need both at the same time. So what we need to know is in a particular learning context, in a particular domain, where is an individual student's strength and what's their preference, right? I know that I, uh, so as a part of this conversation, I know that I have a very hard time learning anything if I only hear it. I need to see it or write it down or get in there and do something. Ideally, read it and then do something for myself. We don't often ask students, though, to assess themselves in the same way. So teaching them uh, and asking them to reflect a bit on, on their strengths as learners and their and their strategies that they use as learners, I think can help with this question. Now, the, the group work part of it, though, how do, we, how do we put groups together, and should we kind of um, have folks who learn in different ways in the same group together? And I think that, that there's truth to that, right? What you want to do is uh, you want to have uh, complementary strengths for any group to work most effectively, right? And so that would, uh, part of that would be having folks who learn, uh, who, who have preferences for different kind of learning modes, right? But again, a lot depends on what you're asking them to do as well. The other thing about group composition, though, is that most of the research shows that the, the most effective way to put together groups is completely randomized assignment. Um, there have been lots of experiments on this because everyone has, again, their intuitions and assumptions, right, about what makes a good group. And of course, some people want to put the strong students and the, the less strong students together. Uh, others say, okay, well, let's divide by, by, uh, by strength, right, uh, or, or focus. Um, but really, the research shows completely randomized groups are best for eliminating unconscious bias or, or trying as best as possible to eliminate unconscious bias. 
And then the follow-up to that is once you randomize the groups, then you have to take a close look at the groups themselves. And so some of the research I'm putting groups together in STEM disciplines, for example, is, okay, randomize the groups, but then look to make sure you don't have uh, a lone representative of a group that has been underrepresented in your discipline in a group, right? And so if you see that, the randomization led to that, then you can do a little bit of shuffling around within the groups to kind of help make that process more inclusive. Randomization appears to be the, the, our best bet for making sure that the group work is as inclusive and, and fair as possible. That was a long answer. I hope it helped. <laughs> From what you said about authenticity, I'm thinking that a lot of uh, the complaints students have about doing group assignments is yes. that the authenticity of the assignment is much higher for some of them than others. And so the ones who see that authenticity are the ones who end up doing the majority of the work. So how do you design a group project right. that has high authenticity for all the students involved? Right. That's a good question. So um, part, of, part of this issue is uh, kind of one that, that covers any teaching and learning scenario, which is how, how do we make it feel relevant to every student, the assignments. And in some ways, the answer to that is you can't. You can only try and kind of hit the target for as many students uh, as possible. Um, so that's part of the answer. And, like a lot of these things, um, you know, I think it is very true that this is all the beginning of a conversation and not the end of one. I think that uh, a question like this really shows that there's so much left to explore and to test out and experiment with. So, uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, a, group of, a truly authentic group assignment, like a really authentic individual assignment, would, uh, would be one that connects them to the tools and materials of the discipline as, uh, as, as, uh, as deeply as possible, right? Um, now, depending on the level you're teaching, uh, that looks a little bit different. Uh, a, a student in intro sociology may not have any tools to evaluate a data set like we were just talking about. Um, they may need a different kind of context, a, a real life scenario. Okay, Here, uh, here's a case study of, of something that has happened. Evaluate it as a group using your sociological imagination, something like that. Uh, as you're teaching more advanced students, though, that can, it can look a little bit different. You can use maybe a data set because you're teaching them. By then, they've had methodology courses. They know a little bit more that will help them accomplish that individual assignment. So the closer it looks to the work of the discipline, the better. And as, as, as instructors in the classroom, a biggest hurdle for us is, what, what if they don't know enough to complete this? What if they don't get to a right answer? And I think that's a fair question, but also I think part of embracing what we know about how people learn is stepping back from that a little bit and say, well, if they don't get the right answer, they may have learned a lot along the way, even though the end result was not quite what we wanted. And so uh, it's a, a, like a lot of teaching and learning questions, there's kind of a trade-off here. Uh, uh, you know, when you, when you put your, all your eggs in one basket, you're leaving another basket empty. And so in this particular case, prioritizing authenticity may sometimes mean that students aren't always getting what we would think as, of as the correct answer, the correct approach. But lear the learning that will happen because of the authenticity may trump that. And in the debriefing, where you as a faculty member talk about the correct answer, they may get what they needed and also have, uh, have learned a lot because of the authenticity. My name is Odesh Paswan. I'm from College of Business. Uh, is that on? That's yes, on. Uh, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, extreme examples. Uh, uh, Army boot camp. Clearly, there is a learning objective, but you go through the same process again and again and again. Right. And there may be some lectures in the morning or evening. Right. 
Right. Flight simulation, again, they must have gone through some kind of theory before, but most of the learning takes place in terms of converting explicit knowledge into tacit knowledge uh, sure. in the flight simulator. Any thoughts on that? I'm giving it too extreme. And people swing from one end to another end in right. a classroom. So, uh, in the army boot camp part of the example, yeah, you're repeating the same thing again and again. Oh, and the again. repetition, right? Yeah. Yes, good. I mean, you're, um, you're you're marching, you're kind of going through, crawling un under the barbed wire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. And you're repeating same thing again and again yes. till it becomes muscle memory. Right. Flight simulation, more or less the same thing. Yeah, that's absolutely true, and I think that. Um, Certainly, you know, this goes back to uh, what I was saying at the beginning of the presentation and the dominance in this discussion of cognitive psychology and, and memory. And yes, I absolutely agree. Students need to remember things in order to do something with them, right? And some of that happens through repetition. And I do think that there is a value to, uh, to gaining basic skills and basic information through repetition, um, when, especially when it's paired with some of these higher order thinking concepts and, and teaching strategies that relate to that. Okay, well, uh, on, and uh, we have a, a, an economics faculty at Rice. Uh, she splits all of her weeks. Tuesday, they do a lot of this. It's a lot of learning the basic concepts through repetition and, uh, and small quizzes sometimes, and then a reflective assessment at the end of the Tuesday class. And then on the Thursday, they come in and they utilize that information. They apply it to a specific kind of problem sets or real world kind of context. So there's a way to combine both in that sense or even in an individual class session. So I absolutely believe it. Uh, as someone who just finished coaching a t-ball team, uh, I can definitely say that repetition is absolutely essential to any degree of, of success. So um, there's a place for it all, for sure. Okay, question about emotion. Sure. Okay, in the English department we teach thousands of students in composition. Right. We're asking to, to learn very critical things about citation, credibility, organization, critical thinking. But we're frequently assigned a book that's very triggering about gender issues, racism, socioeconomic inequality. These are very emotional topics that we can't have 70-year-olds in Washington be clear about. And we're asking 18-year-olds to think critically about very emotional issues. So thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, because, uh, I mean, as, as we were saying, and as you're indicating here, that level, that cognitive work, coming into college for the first time as an 18-year-old and trying to learn those, uh, those ways of thinking in higher education is hard enough without layering the emotional component on top of it, right? And it is, uh, and I'll just reinforce it again, that if that emotional response is happening, there's not a lot of thinking and learning that can happen, right? It's just, it's a biological reality. And in some ways, um, in some ways, that's hard to accept uh, that, that that would be the case, that they couldn't learn. But, and so I think some, reaction, some reactions to this is, well, if I could just, you know, I'm sure that uh, that person will process it and move on to other things. And it's just not true. And so I think that's a hurdle we have to get over. So. Um, I think uh, in the scenario that you've described, giving students tools to manage that emotional response so that they can learn, right? Some of it is just having a conversation about, about the work, right? Uh, some of it is ref uh, giving them reflective assignments at the beginning. And another piece of it, and this is true in, uh, in I think, all courses where difficult discussions are at the heart of things, um, setting community ground rules for how discussions are going to proceed. I know the folks in the social sciences do this a lot, but I think for, for cases that you're describing, really getting together as a group at the beginning of the semester and say, we're gonna be wrestling with some difficult ideas. Let's lay out some ground rules for how that conversation is going to proceed. And there's a lot of great work. Um, there's a paper with, uh, Brave Spaces, Not Safe Spaces in the title of it, very recent, um, that talks about how uh, strategies that we used to use to set these ground rules actually have the opposite effect of being inclusive. And so, um, in other words, we used to recommend tolerance for uh, perhaps 
um, offensive opinions, right? Uh, and tolerance in the sense of a student saying, well, that, that's your opinion, I feel differently, right? Uh, the, the recommendations now, though, to actually have a productive, uh, a productive conversation uh, is a student saying, this is what I think I hear you saying. Is that what you're saying? And with the clarification then, the student can either backtrack or change or clarify. Uh, if it stays the same, then say, uh, focusing on the, what was said and not the person. So what you just said is offensive to me. Here's why, right? And so the, the old recommendations of tolerance uh, were counterproductive. And so now they're talking about getting into it, but being really clear about how, what the steps are, right? Really working with students to say, if this happens, here's what we say, right? Here's the next step that we take. So that's a big part of it. The other thing that I just wanted to mention, because I think this concept is so important, uh, critical thinking, uh, first of all, all of our students are individually developing as critical thinkers at a different rate. Second of all, we know that that can be a deeply uncomfortable process, becoming a critical thinker and developing those skills. And uh, in the, this month's uh, uh, issue of uh, the Journal of College Student Development, there's a brilliant paper on how the, the crux of learning for any student is dissonance, being presented with two opposing ideas and working their way through that process. And the paper makes it really clear as it synthesizes decades worth of work on this that the, the product of that process is discomfort, right? When you're dealing with dissonant ideas, the product of that for students who have never seen that material before is discomfort. And as teachers, we need to make it productive discomfort, right? Okay, I'm really unsettled by that. But, but why am I? And let's, let's work with it. And let's say, okay, well, here's how I can, here's how my, my paradigm will shift now to embody that dissonance, to, to wrestle through that dissonance, even though it's uncomfortable. What the problem is when that discomfort becomes unproductive, right? And in a lot of, in a lot of contexts, a student's first, um, first brush with certain material, that's going to be unproductive discomfort, right? I, I've never seen that before, I've never heard that before, I'm shutting down a little bit, right? And so we have to think about ways to engage the critical thinking process that will keep the discomfort at the productive level rather than unproductive, and the emotional component is a big part of that. Patrick. So this is a great message for faculty to hear. Um, and educators, and that's what we have in this room this morning. But what about for students? So is there any value in taking this message to students and helping them understand how they learn so they can seek out opportunities to be socially engaged or to ask the faculty member, how is this relevant to me, and, and, and kind of pull the authenticity off the stage instead of waiting for it to arrive at their desk. Um, and, and if there is some value in that, how might institutions begin to, to fulfill that, um, getting the message out to students, help them understand how they learn? Right. Well, I think it's absolutely relevant. I see learning as an all hands on deck kind of thing. <laughs> learning more about learning and teaching is a useful thing for anyone on a campus to be doing. And students, um, I, I, again, I was mentioning this in the first question, we don't often ask students to reflect on themselves as thinkers or the development of their critical thinking. Um, where am I now? Why am I uncomfortable? Uh, reflective questions like that. But uh, there's also a place for other kinds of workshops to teach them about this. And so, yes, I, I do think uh, teaching students about these kinds of principles is valuable and having really productive conversations between students and faculty uh, is a really good thing. And, um, you know, uh, one of the landmark books in teaching and learning, What the Best College Teachers Do from 2004, uh, one of the strategies I remember from that book is that a faculty member had a so what clause, or I think he called it a um, who gives a damn clause, but uh, it was, uh, I called it a so what clause. Um, and he had it built into his course so that at any point, a student could raise their hand and say, so what, right? How, how is this relevant to what I need from this course? Now, you have to have a lot of trust 
between faculty and students to do that, obviously. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, if they understand that in order to learn better, it needs to be relevant to them or to, I think this is more to the point, their, what they want to do in the future, right? If I want to be a civil engineer, I don't just need to know the physics. I want to see examples of great bridges, and I want to see bridges that fell apart. And I want to understand why, as a civil engineer, that has happened, right? Uh, and so those are fair questions, I think, for any learner to ask of a learning environment. So I do think uh, prepping, prepping them for this. Um, the, the failure part that we're, we'll talk about after the break, that is even more important. And I think that is a perfect example of how different units can collaborate at a university. I'm a big believer in teaching centers, uh, collaborating with people in student affairs to create opportunities for students to learn skills uh, in resilience and learning from failure and, uh, and developing those kinds of personal strategies that are going to help them in the classroom. I think that those kinds of connections can really benefit uh, everyone at a university. And so that's one tool for it. Um, another way, of course, to do it is to build reflective assignments into a course. And I think that that's a powerful tool as well. Thank you. Very good. Okay. okay. Sure. Well, thank you for that, Josh. Phil, please give him a round of applause. Um, so the, the article you mentioned, which I've, um, from Safe Spaces to Brave Spaces, um, we actually, it's in an, um, it's in, let's see, The Art of Effective Facilitation. There's actually an ebook in the library. I know because I've already saved the article. So yeah, yeah, use UNT libraries. Uh, and uh, you can find um, and print out um, that article for yourself. Um, so we're going to take a 10-minute break. Um, and then when we come back, we're going to do the teaching workshop that Josh is going to lead for us. We're going we're gonna to do two things. We're going to dive deeply into both curiosity and then failure uh, as uh, the happy concept with which we're going to end uh, today. Um, but before we do, I had a great uh, conversation with Odesh uh, at the break. And um, we were talking about just how tricky it can be to define learning. It's a term that, it, it, I guess it's like a lot of the things we've been talking about today, a term that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. <clears throat> And I think the perspectives that most of the, the research I've been talking about take place are varied. There's certainly, learning is absolutely, without a doubt, a biological process, first and foremost, right? When we learn something, our brain changes. Uh, kind of neuroscientists call this plasticity. It's happening literally every second, right? Our brains are changing uh, as, as we're learning and taking in stimuli. But it's more than that, right? Uh, it's uh, it's uh, taking a new perspective, a behavior change, as Odesh was saying. Um, it's also, uh, learning is also taking something that you have mastered in one context and transferring it to another context. Hard to say that you've learned something if you can't do that, and yet transfer is one of the most uh, difficult challenges, I think, for any teaching and learning environment. Also, though, I think more philosophically, someone has learned something if, they, if after they read a great book or watch a great film or, or, or learn about a particular topic, they never see the world in the same way, right? Um, there's a, a wonderful movie from the late 90s that I often use as a metaphor for learning. <clears throat> has anyone seen Pleasantville? Young Tobey Maguire and young Reese Witherspoon at the beginning of their careers. Uh, and uh, as you may remember, those of you who haven't seen it, they're teenagers. Tobey Maguire's character is obsessed with a Leave it to Beaver-like show from the 50s. There's a Nickelodeon marathon on it. Uh, he's watching it, and they both get kind of sucked into the show by Don Knotts in his last role, uh, who's playing a godlike milkman figure. It's a very uh, strange premise, I know. But once they're there, they start teaching the people in the TV world about life. And every time someone has a major revelation and is changed in some way, they turn into technicolor. And, and for me, that's what learning is. Once you learn something that is of value to you, you never experience the world in the same way. And I think all of those definitions weave together into what we might hope for for our students. 
that's a nice background, I think, to the work that we'll do. A lot of, a lot of what we'll, we're about to do is uh, really hands-on, lots of discussion. Um, I want, so I want to start with curiosity. Uh, and this is a topic that, um, so as I was beginning writing the book, I also became a dad for the first time. And watching my daughter explore the world and embody curiosity, every waking moment of her life was defined by curiosity and exploring the world. And that started to make me think, what happens to that, right? This is a question we're going to get to. Where does that go? It defines who we are as children, and then it kind of fades into the background. So we want to talk about that. But this, this part of my project was really inspired by her. And of course, she continues to teach me an awful lot. OK, so uh, curiosity. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take just a minute and think to yourself, what, what is curiosity? What would your definition of curiosity be? This was the first topic I wrote about. And I have to say, when I started to look into the research, I was noticing that there were so many definitions of this term that I almost turned right around and just stopped and said, what am I supposed to do? Everyone's defining this in a different way. So eventually, uh, I, I learned that you just really have to kind of take the premises and synthesize a little bit. So think of your own definition. How many of you had something that looks like either of those two things? A biological drive caused by a state of arousal. No? OK. So these are, these are the biologists. These, this is their definition of curiosity. And that first, uh, that first definition comes from Dan Berlein, who wrote uh, kind of a foundational work on this topic. And uh, for him, uh, curiosity was the same kind of biological drive as hunger or reproduction, that it was natural to human beings to seek out new information and to make sense of it. And he, he couched it in these kinds of terms, this drive and arousal. So the arousal is, I don't know something. And the drive is, I have to figure out the answer to that. Right? Uh, people have picked it up more recently again uh, and, and are really trying to study whether or not it's true. They've added this concept, novelty. That's a, a biological need for novelty. Our brains need new things to really thrive and to keep learning. And that's a, a deep-seated drive. So how about this? Anyone have any, uh, your, does your definition look like either of these? Information gap, the distance between what one knows and what one wants to know. Anyone similar to that? Probably. These are the psychologists. These are uh, the, the, their definitions of curiosity. And the, the first one by Lowenstein, uh, he's probably the, the, the primary researcher on this topic. That definition which he was interested in, uh, he was interested in creating a definition that he could operationalize. What he, what he saw was missing from the study of curiosity was the ability to test it. And so this is the definition that he came up with, an information gap. And that has had uh, a pretty major hold on the study of curiosity. And we can see some logic there, right? What do I know? What do I need to know? And there's a gap between those two things, and I need to bridge that gap. And in bridging that gap, I'm resolving my curiosity, and I'm finding the information that I need to know. Emily Grossnickel, uh, that's a more recent paper, and she uh, basically builds off of Lowenstein, but adds the biological component, that it's not just operational, it's not just mechanical, there is something deep-seated and natural about it as well. So she sort of synthesizes uh, those two camps. What about this one? Surely someone had this. A release of dopamine followed by activity in the brain nucleus accumbens and possibly, possibly the hippocampus. We're not sure about that. No one had that? OK. These, uh, this is the cognitive neuroscience definition of curiosity. Uh, and I have to tell you, the experiments that they are doing to test for this are absolutely fascinating. They, uh, they put the subjects into an fMRI, which is just an MRI. The F stands for functional, right? Uh, they put them into an MRI, and they ask them trivia questions, just like you'd find in Trivial Pursuit or Pub Quiz Night, uh, any, any uh, uh, sort of normal kinds of trivia. 
but then they have to rate their confidence in their answer. That's a key part of these experiments. So they ask them the question, and then what they're looking for, what, what you look for in an fMRI, a lot of people say brain activity, that's not quite true. What an fMRI shows is where blood is flowing in the brain. And the, the supposition is that if blood is flowing there, you must be using that part of your brain, right? And so that's what an fMRI measures. So that's what they're looking for. Here's what they found. When you get a question right, that's an easy question, not much going on up there. Not much learning happening. It's more rote and mechanical than anything else. If you get a question wrong that you expected to get right, mass chaos, right? <laughs> Alarms are going off inside the brain. Uh, blood is flowing everywhere because this is, a, this is absolutely built in to our biological structure. If we do not know something that we thought we knew, our brains are going into overdrive to try and figure it out. And so what, what they're seeing is uh, not just the activity, but they're testing the blood, which is how they know about the dopamine. They test the blood, and they see a huge spike of dopamine at that moment when you get a question wrong that you expect it to get right. Now, dopamine has been kind of falsely uh, connected to lots of things, right? Uh, uh, everything from cell phones to addiction and things like that. There, it, plays a, uh, it plays a part in kind of our reward processes, still trying to figure out exactly what. But the fact that we get this spike means that our brain was anticipating something that it didn't get, right? And so now you have the chemicals <laughs> raging through in order to try and figure out what that was. Good. So you can see there's a lot of difference here. There's some synthesis and overlap, but there's a lot of difference as well. Because, and this is my favorite one, despite its importance, no one really agrees on what it means. Right? And that is the result of what I was talking about earlier. That um, by and large, we're working in the, the silos of our own disciplines. And so there's, no, there's really no incentive to synthesize or make connections and, and come up with common definitions. But for understanding how curiosity connects to learning, there's a real incentive there. We have to understand it if we're going to design teaching strategies that maximize it. Right? So this is kind of the landscape that you're dealing with here. Now, uh, we are by far, by no means, are we the only species to exhibit curiosity. If you are a dog owner, you have seen that look many times. That's curiosity. What is going on? Uh, and um, there was a, a great paper, I think it was out a couple months ago that I read. They, uh, they put dogs into fMRIs, and they were, uh, they were doing two things. They were saying uh, words and commands that most dogs were familiar with, sit, stay, uh, that sort of thing. And then they were just throwing in completely random words that most dogs had never heard before. Like the humans, the sit and the stay, that was pretty OK. Uh, but the, the unfamiliar words, chaos, right? And what they were speculating is dogs are so attuned to their response to humans that when they hear something that they haven't heard before, they're desperately trying to make sense of it so that they can uh, reestablish that connection uh, with, uh, with their human, right? And so all animals have this kind of curiosity, right? Especially those that have been a part of our own lives for many thousands of years. And of course, our primate cousins are among the most curious species, right? Uh, primatologists and anthropologists have studied curiosity in apes for a very long time, and, and those studies uh, are well documented. So this, is, this places us into a much larger conversation about learning, uh, and it is absolutely fundamental to who we are. I interviewed a lot of evolutionary biologists when I was writing this book, uh, specifically about curiosity and uh, the connection uh, the connections over time. And what they said without fail was because it existed, because curiosity existed before human beings, it must absolutely be a critical part of how we evolved as human beings and a critical part of how we still learn, right? And so that, of all the topics that we've talked about today, this is the one that has the longest history. This is absolutely just kind of a fundamental part of who we are. And that line there about how uh, we ascended as a species through incandescent curiosity, I think that says it all. That nicely captures our relationship with it and how we need it to learn. I don't know this little fellow. I wish I did. He looks deeply curious, though. 
uh, because uh, the, one of the primary ways that people have studied curiosity is to study children and their curiosity. Just like I was talking about with my daughter, many psychologists and scientists have studied it with children. Now, a, a kind of a primary way they have talked about this is through children's questions that they ask, right? This goes all the way back to Piaget. I was talking about Piaget a little bit earlier. Jean Piaget, one of the, um, uh, just a, 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 in the pantheon of developmental psychologists, if there is such a thing, he is there. I found that people really like what he had to say or really don't like what he had to say. There's no in-between on Piaget. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, that he's known for is testing the questions of, of, of his subjects, who also happen to be his own children. So you can imagine the difficult conversations in the Piaget household about some of these experiments, right? Um, but so he started this line of research where uh, for, for most of it, they're, they're kind of counting and categorizing children's questions. How many questions are they asking? What kinds of questions are they asking, right? And anyone who's familiar with children around the age of three or four knows that there are many, many questions that get asked on a daily basis, right? Uh, that, and, and that's important, and that's good. And as, as you know, there's a, as, as, much as at times we might wish there were fewer questions, this is a really important aspect of cognitive development. What I have up here, though, uh, is a, a reference to uh, Michelle Schoenard, who did some important research where she was not just looking at the numbers of questions, but she was really digging into what kinds of questions were children asking and how is that connected to cognitive development. And what she found, and this is fascinating, um, I, I absolutely love this, what she found was that without fail, she was studying infants through age five. Uh, and infants, though they can't talk, they can still engage in questioning behaviors by pointing, nodding, things like that. So she was looking at that too. Without fail, a what question was always followed by a why question. What is that? Why? What is that? Why? And even when it's a string of what questions, they're always followed by at least one why question. Right? And so that is really interesting for studying teaching and learning because we spill an awful lot of ink trying to figure out how to ask the right questions and how to teach people to ask the right questions. And it turns out they might have known that for a very long time. And our job is not to teach them how to do it, but to give them opportunities for exercising that, for finding ways to utilize this questioning pattern that they've known for a long time. Right? And so this is, this is the connection in that first quote that we looked at about the continuum between uh, the children's learning and adult learning. This is, this is right in that sphere that, uh, that we learn very much the same way. And our job as a teacher is simply to step back and give them the environment to develop that, right? Uh, interesting, she, uh, interestingly, she also showed uh, that questions are the unit of curiosity and that there is a spike in the number of questions. This happened with every, every child she looked at. A spike in the number of questions somewhere between three and a half and four. And once that spike happens, the number of questions goes down and it never climbs back up to that point ever again. Uh, and uh, that happens for two reasons. One is uh, somehow some sort of cognitive development phase has passed, right? The, that the, question, the number of questions going up was critical for some piece of uh, a child's cognitive development, and then they don't need it anymore. But also, as we're about to see, the fate of curiosity also rests in the environment in which a, uh, a child is placed. And so after you get past the age of five, the question is, what happens to this? We see all the questions. We know that curiosity drives children's lives. Where does it go? What happens to it? I'm sure you're all answering this question in your head right now, right? And there are many answers to this question and, uh, between you and me. Some of it got cut out of the draft of my book because the editor said it was too ranty. People aren't going to like how, uh, how ranty this sounds. Uh, you got to step back from the edge uh, and, and move on. Um, but so there are many, many reasons what uh, uh, causes of, as to what happens to it. But this is Susan Engel and the Hungry Mind, which is a brilliant book about curiosity, not just about higher ed, but um, that beyond early childhood, 
its fate rests in the people and experiences that surround a child's life, right? And so the development, the use of that curiosity is going to depend on the school environment and the home environment from that point forward. And so there are lots of things that might happen between the time a child is five and the 18-year-old who ends up in our class or the non-traditional student who ends up in our class. There are many things that might happen. And as teachers, we can, cult we can cultivate that. We can kind of pull it back uh, into the forefront and that that's going to help maximize their learning because it's been such a fundamental part of their learning for so long. Right? Now, it's not all the environment. Certainly, students uh, and children um, grow up and they figure out the education game. They know what it is that they have to do to get the thing that they want, right? Okay, well, I need to get into a good college, so I need to get the GPA, so I'll do the thing to get me the GPA that's going to get me into college, right? They become really strategic. And those environments are not conducive to cultivating curiosity and to taking intellectual risks, right? So that's a big part of it. So now I want you to think about this. After, after what we've been talking about, and this is in the handout, these same questions are on the handout. After what we've been talking about, I want you to think about how we can cultivate curiosity in our own courses. How can we help our students draw that back from the background into the forefront of their learning process? So I have three questions here. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you about seven or eight minutes just to answer them on your own. Just sketch out some ideas, play with ideas uh, in a blue sky. And then after that, I'm going to let you talk in your tables about some of the ideas you came up with. And then maybe we'll share out from a couple of tables as to interesting approaches that you've heard. So say a couple, couple of minutes. Uh, you're choosing one of the courses you're teaching next semester. Even, you may not want to think about next semester yet. And I get that. But, uh, uh, but choose one of those courses. What questions animate the work of that course? And what I mean by that is what are the, what are the foundational questions that drive the work of that course? What would you hope? Uh, what kinds of big questions would you hope students could answer? by the end of that semester, or attempt an answer. The second one is to select one of those questions and design an assignment that might help uh, the students get that. And then the third is other areas of, uh, of the course where you might uh, heighten the curiosity. So take seven minutes, work on that by yourselves, and then we'll transition to tables. Who wants to share? There we go. Idea. Oh, I probably don't need that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's just interesting that our table almost immediately started talking about the gateway classes and the capstone classes. Good. In what way? Just That's well, great. just thinking about like how do we get people curious about our field, mm -hmm. but then when they're going to graduate, how do we get them to kind of get curious about what's going on out in the so-called real world? Right. You know. So just those points of contact of getting people and sending them out is a place where it feels like we very much have this gut feeling like we need to instill them with a certain kind of desire to learn or what was it dopamine reward or you know right <laughs> right 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 you know, so I think that's interesting a lot of teachers find crafting those classes to be particularly maybe engaging but also problematic mm -hmm. oh good and I'm glad this came up because I, I often hear uh, a lot of questions about how do we how do we make those introductory level courses, uh, whether they're gen ed or not, <clears throat> uh, cultivate more curiosity? Because often people feel a lot of pressure to cover all the content, right? Uh, and they, there's, uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of room for this. But um, there, there are smaller or bigger things that we can do. You know, whole course redesign is one, of course. But um, framing, rather than framing a syllabus around the concepts and content you want to teach, you could frame it around questions you want to answer. And structurally, the course could look very much the same. But at the end of every kind of unit, you could come back to the, you could come back to the leading question, the prefatory question, and say, OK, so what have we learned about this? How, how might we answer this question now? So that's one way to kind of just tweak uh, sort of an entryway into building curiosity into those introductory level courses, as they can be challenging. Yet we know uh, there have been a lot of studies recently to show that it's the introductory level where students are making decisions about majors. 
and specifically the teacher who teaches them the intro course has a significant and outsized impact on their decision of major. Right? Um, I think it was Ball State there uh, in Indiana, their English department was uh, sort of uh, synthesized those studies and made big curriculum changes uh, to their major um, based on what they were finding there. One of the biggest things were they put, the, they, they put their department's best teachers in the introductory level courses. And they saw, whereas most humanities, especially English departments, are seeing a dip in majors, they saw an increase in majors, right? And so there's something to that. There's, some, there's, there's real data now to show that. Good, other, other tables, one or two more. Who else wants to share? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We cheated a little bit because we're the Graduate Students Teaching Excellence Program okay, and we sure. teach this stuff to our students. But what we're finding out uh, almost consistently is how to get adult learners to step out of their comfort zone, right. acknowledging that adults can choose to suffer the consequences and just not learn anything from you. So uh, one of the things uh, that I've experienced myself is trying to get adults to physically move to collaboratively learn for one another doing a think, pair, share mm -hmm. type of activity. Nice. And so, uh, you know, we talked about some things like, you know, having group rule, roles and everything so that everybody's there would, you know, have a part that they need to play uh, to contribute to their group's knowledge. And then at the end, each of them be responsible for presenting mm -hmm. what they are, now that you've given us me something to do, and. and question answered and wanting the questions within their assignment. So that's kind of what we, Great. we, we share it among one another here. Yeah, that's fantastic. Good, one more, anyone else? And we're just scratching the surface of, of this topic. Uh, there's a lot to mull over. Uh, and there's everything from the kind of course design level to the assignment design and to even the classroom interactions at that level too, right? So thinking through how do we build curiosity in, at every one of those levels. And what I don't want to leave you with uh, today is a feeling like we are responsible for making them curious. That is not really the message I want to send. It's that people learn when their curiosity is primed. And so to, to design better courses and activities, we can do some of these things so that we're helping them learn more. You yourself are not responsible for making a student curiosity. That's not the message. It's really how do we use this information. Good. Okay. Let's end on a really positive note. <laughs> um, and I, that's only partly tongue-in-cheek because I really do actually think that uh, this, is a, this is a subject that's getting a lot of attention now. And that there's, a, there's so much that we can do to help students succeed if we focus on building opportunities for them to fail in a low stakes environment. And I'm using this word very specifically, very intentionally uh, for a couple of reasons. And one is to destigmatize it. I could have used error, I could have used mistake, I could have used lots of different words, but I'm using failure on purpose because our students are absolutely terrified of failure. In fact, there's an epidemic in higher education. The percentage of students who fear failure is astronomical in every study I've looked at. What's even more interesting about that is that students fear failure even if they have not experienced very much of it themselves. And so even those students who are the highest achievers and look like they have the most success in your departments, they fear it as well, right? Uh, and, and part of it, and we're going to talk about some of this, uh, part of it is because uh, this has been cultivated in them for a very long time, right? That this is, a, this is a message that gets sent from the time they're very young, that failure is bad, what we want is success. Now, here's the issue, though. As academics, as practitioners in our field, as teachers, whichever identity is most salient for you, we know that learning is an iterative process. We try something, we fail, we learn from that, we try something again. This is how we operate. And yet our educational systems are set up in exactly the opposite direction, right? 
uh, our educational systems are set up to prioritize high stakes assessments and very few opportunities to achieve in those assessments and even fewer opportunities to take intellectual risks. And if a student is afraid of failing, taking a risk is at the bottom of their list of things that they want to do. And it's been cultivated in them to avoid any situation where they have to put themselves out there and possibly get something wrong. This is not just an educational thing, it's their, their entire lives have been, they've been pushed in that direction. But if we know that people need to fail in order to learn, and our systems are set up in that direction, we have this dilemma. What are we supposed to do? Uh, and we are, we are, of course, operating within universities, within systems that require us to evaluate someone at the end of the semester. Uh, and that, or throughout the semester, and to give a final grade, of, of course. And w a lot of what we know about grades uh, is that in every way we want a student to uh, learn, grades tamp down on that process. We want them to be motivated, grades smash that. We want them to take intellectual risks, not in the grading system, right? And so we're sending the opposite message that we actually want them uh, to do, right? Now, grades can be a kind of feedback, but they're not everything. So, right. So we want to start with the fact, how do we learn from failure? So as it turns out, human beings make an awful lot of mistakes all the time, right? We are constantly making errors. And that sounds depressing, but uh, what, I want to, uh, what I want to highlight here is that this is a feature, not a bug. And I'll get to that in a second. How do we make errors? Um, well, in a lot of different ways. This is another wonderful book. Also, you know, a little depressing because it's all about how we're wrong all the time. But, um, but we, we rely on basic kinds of um, cheats in order to make decisions. And so what Catherine Schultz is talking about here, we're really, uh, as we make decisions, we rely far more on probability than possibility. If something has happened nine times, we think it's, we make a decision based on it happening a tenth time. Not whether it actually will, but, or possibly will, but, but probably will, right? We don't really think about possible. And there are good reasons for that, right? If we just stopped and pondered every single decision we were going to make every day, we wouldn't get anywhere, right? We'd barely get out of our bedroom. So there are good reasons for that. Uh, some of this work relies on uh, the work that uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky did. Daniel Kahneman wrote uh, a, a, an important book a few years ago, Thinking Fast and Slow. Even more than that, he won the, uh, the Nobel for economics around that same time. Uh, his, part, his partner uh, in research, Amos Tversky, uh, would have won too, but died before, uh, before the, it was issued. They spent their whole career analyzing the heuristics that people use to make decisions and how those are deeply flawed. Uh, and so one of, one of the most common and most prominent heuristics that we use is the causality heuristic. We are really good at attributing causality where it does not occur. We see situation A and then situation B follows it. We say A cause B. We're just making that decision all the time without ever assessing it. It's a heuristic that we use to stand in for more complex thinking. And it allows us to kind of get through our daily lives, but it's often flawed. So we're making mistakes all the time, both big and small, right? And mistakes in the classroom setting can look everything like, you know, the basic uh, kind of error in a math problem to deep misconceptions, right? So this is, this is the bad news, right? We're making mistakes all the time. But like I said, it's a feature, not a bug. We are actually built uh, to make mistakes and to learn from those errors. We have two signal processes in our brain. ERN stands for the error response negativity. PE is error positivity, and they are filtering every stimulus that kind of runs through. Uh, error, the ERN is basically checking le uh, right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, everything that comes through it. The PE, on the other hand, is not only detecting whether we got something wrong, but when it, when it does, it's kind of like an alarm in our brain, and it, it, uh, it attracts the cognitive resources to solve the problem. So we have these, these structures, these elements to the way we uh, are designed to detect error and to learn from error. This is how we're built. It's supposed to be this way. 
Mistakes are a part of, of who we are, and we need to uh, then cultivate that in our educational environment. As I said, this is how students see failure. We are talking about the advantage of it and the benefit and that we all learn from this, but this is how they see it, in big red letters that communicate to them that they have not lived up to a standard, that they have not, uh, that they have not achieved the bar that has been set. That is not a context where you're going to get students who develop the, the new solutions to world problems because they don't want to take the risk if this is what's going to happen to them, right? And so there must be ways that within this system we can design smaller opportunities for students to try and fail and learn from that even if we have to give a grade at the end of the day. Uh, there are, of course, folks who are experimenting with all kinds of alternative grading schemes, even ungrading, uh, where they, they don't give a grade on anything and the final grade is determined through a negotiation with the student at the end. Uh, that's all the way at the end of the spectrum, and there are many other, uh, many other alternative models, contract grading, specifications grading, portfolio grading. I'm sure you've heard of those. So people are trying, but it depends on a few things. It depends on understanding first why college students might fail in the first place. And some of the reasons a college student might fail have nothing to do with what is actually happening in the course. Right? Uh, remember, students are human beings who are bringing with them their lives into your courses, and so some of it may have to do with what they are experiencing outside of our courses. And this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, you may be familiar with it, but basically the idea here is that if those, if those basic needs at the bottom of that pyramid are not met, things like, hung, uh, things like having enough food to eat, having enough water to drink, having a place to stay, feeling safe psychologically and physically, if those are not met, students are not learning calculus. They are not learning history. They have other, uh, they're going through a process that will not permit them to learn to the extent we want them to to succeed. So part of that is not necessarily fixing this, although there are many working on campuses today to establish things like food pantries and, and things like that, right, to address some of these issues. I, I saw this, uh, someone phrased it recently, I think, on social media, students have to Maslow before they can bloom, referring to Bloom's taxonomy. And it's absolutely right. It's absolutely right. You can't get to the higher order stuff if you haven't, if you haven't met some of these needs, right? Good. So some of what they're, uh, they're going through uh, has to do with things outside of our control. Some of it has to do with, uh, with cognitive stuff as well. Certainly, we all know roadblocks in our own courses uh, that, that uh, students may stumble over. There's also things like um, cognitive load, how much we can hold in our heads at any one time, right? Uh, there are things like incorrect prior knowledge. It's a student bringing faulty models of concepts into your course, and how do you change that? And guess what? Sometimes that's really, really hard, especially when that model is, they have an emotional or psychological, uh, psychological connection to that model, right? And so there are many reasons cognitively, too, why a student might struggle in the course, and you combine that with the Maslow stuff, and teaching's really hard. That might be the message that I'm sending, uh, but there are answers to help us. So, how do we then utilize failure, the concept of failure, within our systems and within our courses to help students learn in the way we know that they're naturally uh, kind of built to learn? Well, it depends on two things. The first of which, if you really want to do this in your classroom, the first thing we have to do, both in our courses and in our universities, is actually prepare students how to learn from failure. If you just go into your course and say, Today, we're just going to do a lot of failing, and it's going to be okay. You might have a revolution on your hands. They might storm for the doors, right? Uh, because they're not prepared. We have to prepare them how to learn from failure. These are some common models that folks are experimenting with and playing around with. Uh, these are simply examples. They are not endorsements, and that's really important. Because the first two have had some work in recent years that have really shown that they're not all that they're cracked up to be. Uh, my own approach to helping students develop resiliency uh, in all kinds of ways is to take what I think are the best of these models and to weave them into more holistic 
solutions, right? And so let's take fixed versus growth mindsets. Uh, the, this has been a model, Carol Dweck's model, that lots of people have been talking about. A fixed mindset, students, uh, a student with a fixed mindset believes their intelligence is fixed, that, it can't, uh, that they can't change that. Growth mindset means if you work harder, you'll learn more, right? Very basic. Um, there, was a, there was a recent, I think it was last year, a meta-analysis that showed that there was no correlation between having a growth mindset and actual achievement in the classroom. Uh, there was a correlation between attitude toward learning, but not actually a correlation with, with achievement and actual learning. So thing, taking it with a grain of salt. The basic idea, though, that if we help students learn that if they just work, if they work at it and grow, that, that they will achieve more, right? That failure is not the end of the road. It's just, it's just a hurdle to be left over. Right? That's actually good. We can work with that, right? Uh, grit, another really popular one that's come under fire. Grit is passion plus, uh, plus perseverance. That was Angela Duckworth's model. Um, and it's, uh, the reason it's come under fire is because she said it was predictive of success. The higher you scored on her grit scale, the more you were going to succeed. And that's what's been unpacked. Uh, they're, they're finding that there is no predictive relationship. Right? The other issues with these first two that the third one, Agency, by Anadaya Kundu, that that one uh, solves. The first two never address the socioeconomic and cultural realities of a student's life, right? They never say, you know, it might be easier for one student to have a growth mindset than another student, given their circumstances. They never say that. Kundu steps in and says, yeah, I like what you're saying, but we gotta pay attention to that stuff too. This is, a, this is a systemic thing. This is a cultural thing. And our institutions have to pay attention to an entire student's life before we start uh, superimposing a kind of resiliency model on top of that. So I, I really like that one because it's kind of weaving the best of what we know from research on how people learn uh, together. The final one, that's really exciting too. Lynn Sigler, uh, this is something we can kind of do in a lot of our disciplines. She, uh, she separated her students into, into two groups. Uh, one group was learning about scientists solely through the lens of their successes, and another group was learning about scientists solely through the lens of the, failure, uh, lens of the failures that it took before the successes. That group did much better on the final exam than the group that was learning through the lens of successes. And the idea there is that you're breaking down the stereotypes about failure that you're making students respond differently to the material because of the way you're talking about the material. So that's another possibility. As I said, there are other examples, but we need to utilize information to help students become more resilient to learn from failure before we do number two, which is actually designing opportunities for failure. Now this can look, there can be a lot of different ways. On the small scale, Distributing your final grade over more assignments with lower stakes is just a basic way to build in more opportunities for failure. So if a student is in a course with three assignments, each of which is 33 and a third percent of the grade, there is no incentive at all for them to try anything outside the box, right? Uh, because the, there's so much pressure on that structure. But if you distribute it more over lower stakes assignments, that's an easy way uh, to kind of implement this uh, right away. Um, other options include, uh, let's see, um, some people are having great success with uh, presenting uh, incorrect solutions to problems, right? And having students in class and on exams talk about why the problem is incorrect, what, 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 the, what could have happened to make it correct, uh, one model that I absolutely love uh, for multiple choice tests, uh, I've seen several people using a model where the first step is selecting the correct answer. The next step is identify another answer and explain why it's wrong. The uh, third step is identify another answer and explain what the question might have looked like to get to that answer, right? And so really breaking down what, what it is that we want from them, right? giving, uh, uh, reorienting their relationship to mistakes and failure, giving them more opportunities just to experiment. And with that in mind, I would say that one, the, 
if I had to boil this down to one suggestion uh, that the research is absolutely clear on, is that if we really want to reorient students' uh, relationship with failure and help them learn from those moments, we have to divest grades from feedback. It's feedback that they learn from, not the grade. In fact, there's a classic paper from the late 80s on this. Students were separated into three conditions, one, uh, one, uh, three groups. One group got only feedback, one group got only a grade, and one gra uh, group got a grade plus feedback. The researchers hypothesized that it would be that group who was most motivated to learn, the grade plus the feedback, because they were getting it all. As it turned out, it was the group that only got feedback who was most motivated at the end of the semester. We learn most from feedback, and I'm sure that we can probably think of examples in our own learning stories where it's feedback that helped us, either informal or formal feedback, uh, rather than the grade. The grade communicates how far, how much you met a standard, right? The feedback says, I see where you're going here. Here's what you need to, here's what you need to improve. Here's what you need to make the next step. That is the learning tool, and that is the key to helping students learn from these moments. Good. So I have a, we have seven minutes. So instead of writing down some notes this time, I just want you to start to talk with each other about these two questions. One is kind of at the level of course design. Where can you include some opportunities for failure in your syllabus? And one is at the level of classroom practices. How might you utilize some pedagogies of failure? So take about, uh, take about four minutes and talk to each other about some of these questions. We'll share out, and then that'll be the end, I think. Right? Yeah. OK. <clears throat> I, won't, I won't ask you to share this one out. I know from experience that a lot of this, uh, a lot of designing opportunities for failure, very, uh, it's complicated, and it, a lot of these ideas are nascent. And um, so I want to just say, uh, and then I'll have time for a question or two. I want to just say that I encourage you to experiment and play around with some of these things. There are the the research is is really just starting in a lot of these areas. And what we need are people to try things out and to, uh, and to see where they go and to see how we can refine them. And so I just encourage you to do that in your courses. E send me an email, let me know how it goes, and I'd love to talk with you about them. Uh, and I, I do have time for a question or two before we wrap up, I think. Yeah, I, I heard someone say something really provocative, and I thought it was a great question. Why do we even give grades for the first year or two? Why don't we just have pass-fail? Um, what are some alternatives besides grading? Because we can all agree that you know none of us can design a set of perfect, perfectly accurate assessments. Um, so what are some, some alternatives? Right. Um, it's a good way to, to end, I think, because it's, uh, it's, it's idealistic in the best ways, I think. Um, there, there are definitely some universities who are completely gradeless, right? We know about those, Hampshire College, St. John's, and Annapolis, places like that. Um, they've been gradeless since the beginning. It's really hard to go retroactive on this, right? Uh, let's just get rid of grades. So there are certainly some colleges that do that. There are others, though, that are experimenting in the ways that you have just suggested by masking the grades for the first year, not having any grades at all for the first year, uh, or the pass-fail. Um, and I think... The pass-fail has been the most common simply because, uh, logistically speaking, uh, not, uh, not all the classes that students take in their first year have only first-year students in them, right? And so how, how, do you, how do you give pass-fail to some and letter grades to others when they're in courses with sophomores and juniors, things like that, right? And pass-fail seems to be an easy, uh, easy maneuver within the system to just change it at the end, right? Uh, and so there are ways that universities are experimenting with that. As I said, individual instructors are trying their best to mitigate this as well. Um, portfolio grading, contract grading. Contract grading is one of the more radical ones, right? Uh, and in contract grading, essentially you say, if you do these 15 things, you will get an A for the course. If you do 12 of them, you will get a B. If you do nine, you get a C, et cetera. Now to really embrace contract grading, you as an instructor have to buy into the fact 
that by doing those things, they will have learned in the course, right? And so what that means is really careful attention to assignment design so that they can't help but learn if they are completing the assignments. And so that, things like that instructors are, are working with. Um, uh, my next project is on grades and grading, so I'm, I have <laughs> dived headfirst into this question. Uh, what's interesting to me, one of the first things I've been doing is trying to find high schools across the country that don't give grades. Because they're, you know, they, high schools have pressure to give grades because of students getting into college. Colleges have pressure to get in, give grades because they thought that's what employers wanted. Now the great thing about the higher ed moment is that we have lots of employers who are now saying, eh, we don't really care about GPA. We want them to have these kinds of skills coming out, right? Um, so there, this is a moment for higher ed. Uh, high schools, though, still don't have that incentive, but I have found some that have, have switched. Um, in fact, in Vermont and Maine, the legislatures have mandated that all high schools move to proficiency grading, not letter grading. Uh, now, that is going as you would probably expect it to. Uh, very difficult uh, and uh, more successful in some areas than others, but it's a recognition that in order to really do something about it, it has to be a whole system change. And people, at least at this point now, are willing to try, right? In Maine, it's not going super well. Vermont, it's, it's going better, right? And some of it has, not, has nothing to do at all with the grades themselves. Some of the challenges have to do simply with communication. So, uh, I was talking to someone in Maine and the, the issue that they found was communicate, the, the legislature did a poor job communicating to the school systems, who then did a poor job communicating to teachers and parents. And you can imagine getting a letter as a parent from the school system saying, we're getting rid of grades. We're not gonna have grades anymore, it's just gonna be narrative feedback. And of course they freaked out, right? And they went, they went to the system and said, how's my kid gonna get into college? with no grades, right? So there was a communication issue. And I, I do think that we have an opportunity to experiment with systems because this, you know, above, any, above anything else, we can, we can talk about our own courses and there are things we can do. But until that changes, we're always trapped in a system that is sending the message to them that, uh, okay, this is all fine and good to learn from failure, but you have to get an A to get into grad school. So great question. Thank you all very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks.